It's good to be with you this morning. On this last day of July already, if you can believe that, it's going fast. Let me draw your attention to uh, some of the things that are happening here in the life of the church. I want to let you know that our next Spark service, our contemporary service that happens in the evening, will be um, on August 21st. Uh, we also have uh, worship in the park where we're going to, to celebrate the first responders and, and have a blessing over them, which will be a great thing. It's all coming together, and it's going to be an exciting day on September 11th. We also have our Fun in the Sun coming up. Um, do we have an announcement about that at all, Priscilla? Um, do we have an announcement about the Fun in the Sun at all? Char, do you have anything to add to that? No, but we want everybody to be able to have the chicken legs. All right. So let us know you're coming. Okay. Uh, is there any other announcements? Just to let you know that we will be doing, um, we'll be starting our second week of the, the study of the Bishop's Book this coming Thursday. If you were not here or able to be here um, this past Thursday, you're more than welcome to come this coming Thursday. And that's at 10 o'clock here on Thursday morning. And we have some extra books. If you would like a copy of them, um, the suggested donation is $10 for that book. That would cover the cost. Um, we have some extra in the office. So if that's something that you would like, um, we have one for you, or we can get one for you too. Um, is there any other announcements that we need to draw attention to that I did not highlight this morning? One other announcement, today is the fifth Sunday of the month, and usually on the fifth Sunday of the month, we take an offering for the, the Hickson Scholarship to help out those who are going to college, and we usually donate our free, um, a loose change to that, so we're going to send the, the buckets around, and it's going to be kind of noisy in here um, for a few, few minutes. So let's um, prepare our hearts for that offering. Jeremy, if you could just play something. Let's join together with the opening hymn, uh, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Let's prepare our hearts this morning for worship in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit.
Let's join together with the call to worship. Join with me. O gracious God, we pray for your holy church universal, that you would be pleased to fill it with all truth and all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, establish it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of God, never loves succession for us. Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. And now we have some special music by our own Drew Gavlik. dismayed whate'er betide God will take care of you beneath his wings of love abide God will take care of you God will take care of you through every day or all the way he will take care of you, God will take care of you. Through days of toil when heart doth fail, God will take care of you. When dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. test, God will take care of you. Lean weary one upon his breast, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. True for that blessing. Ashley has a children's moment if the kids would like to come down. Good morning. How are you guys doing today? Good. That was really excited good. That's a good thing. Well, now my printer kind of printed these out weird, but who can tell what these are? What do they look like? They are pieces of pie. Mmm. You guys like pie? All right, well here, I have two slices of pie. Now, if I let you choose one of these pieces to eat, which one would you choose, the big one or the little one? The little one? See, I would choose the big, there we go. I would choose the big one. Now, that reminds me of a story about a brother and sister named Jessica and Will. One day, Jessica and Will came in from school and wanted a snack. Their mother had baked a pie earlier in the week and there was just enough left for each of them to have a slice. Let's have a piece of pie, suggested Will. I'll get the pie while you get us a glass of milk. 
When Will sliced the pie, it turned out like these two slices. One slice was much larger than the other one. Jessica poured each of them a glass of milk and sat down at the table. Will brought the pie and placed the small slice in front of Jessica and kept the large slice for himself. Look what you've done, cried Jessica. You gave me the small piece of pie and kept the big slice for yourself. Well, how would you have done it, Will said. Well, if I were serving the pie, Jessica said, I would have given you the large slice and kept the smaller slice for myself. Well, what are you complaining about? That's exactly what I did. Will and Jessica both laughed and began eating their pie. Now, we might, not, we might laugh at that story, but selfishness and greed is a very serious subject. Every day, we see people who not only want the biggest slice of pie for themselves, they want the whole pie. Jesus told a story about a man who was like that. Now, the man in Jesus' story was very rich. He had a large farm, and it produced very good crops. What should I do, the man said to himself. I have had such a large harvest that I don't have room in my barns to store all of it. Well, what do you think the man did? Any ideas? A store farm? Oh, gotcha. Well, he could have shared some of what he had with those who didn't have very much, couldn't he? Do you think that's what the man did? Mm -mm. Instead, he said, I know what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I will say to myself, you have plenty of everything. Enjoy it. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now God said to the rich man, you fool. You will die this very night. Then who will get everything? God is good, and he has given most of us more than we need. The question is, what will we do with what God has given us? Will we share it with those who don't have much, or will we greedily keep it for ourselves? Now, remember the warning that Jesus gave to the listeners of his story. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. All right. Let's go ahead and talk to Jesus. Father, we thank you for looking over us and for, for helping us through our lives. God, I ask that you would just help us to see those people in need and to share the blessings that you've given us with those people who don't have what we have. In your name I pray, amen. Tells me so. Let's take some time this morning and greet each other with the peace of Christ.
Well, we have been traveling through the Gospel of Luke this summer, and if you have noticed the last few Sundays, Jesus is teaching on some very hard subjects. Last week we looked at how Jesus taught us how to pray. He talked about being too busy. The week before we talked about Mary and Martha, and this Sunday we're looking at a, a, a worldwide issue, the issue of greed. And John Huff is going to read our scripture. So welcome, my friend John. Come on. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be judge of our, or arbitrator over you? And he, he said then to them then, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought, and, he th the, the, and the man, he thought to himself, what should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your life is being demanded of you, and, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Lord God, we thank you for this time that we can come together and look at the words that John read for us. Help us to take them, and if it needs to convict us, Lord, help it to convict our spirit. Help us to take it out into the world and preach it there and live it there. And we just pray this in your name. Amen. Well, did you see the news this week? I don't know if you saw this. Um, a guy named Mark Zuckerberg earned $3.4 billion in one hour, or something like that. Some of the websites I went to said they, he earned more than $4 billion. Some say $2 billion. But I think, you know what, when you get up that high, they probably just lose count. Mark Zuckerberg is the founder of Facebook, if you did not know, or so it would seem. If you watch The Social Network, the, the movie, there's some question there. I think it's crazy. Um, and you know what? There's all kinds of figures all over the Internet at how much he is worth or how much he has. They say, and one site said he was worth $56.4 billion. Uh, like the rich, one of the richest people in the world. Like he needs another $3.4 billion. Um, more than ever has, have people been using this social network called Facebook. And Zuckerberg keeps earning more and more. And maybe he could give $3.4 billion to our church, do you think? It is not like he's going to ever spend all that cash. Now, you know what? There's nothing wrong with having a lot of money. In fact, a lot of people in Scripture that are godly people had a lot of money, like David and Abraham. There are many wealthy people in the Bible. And if you go on the Internet, you'll find that Mark Zuckerberg donated a lot of his money. But it might be a big tax write-off. We don't know the whole story. And it is up to, to God to judge that. But $56 billion or $54 billion, can you imagine? I think anyone who had that much money would struggle a little bit with this thing called greed. Now, I remember a, a, a lady that lived down the street from us when we were growing up. She was a widow and she was older. And when she got to the place that she was not able to live on her own anymore, 
the nursing home came in and picked her up. I remember the nursing home taking her out of the front door in an ambulance and the children taking the stuff that they wanted out the back door. It is an image that I will never forget. For it is greed that sometimes runs us, and it is greed that sometimes ruins us. The man approached Jesus um, in our scripture that John read this morning. He was a man whose inheritance threatened to destroy him as well. He and his brother were arguing over that inheritance And he interrupted Jesus' ministry, asking our Savior to intercede on a legal matter and rule in his favor. And did you see? Jesus was not impressed. In fact, he says, man, who appointed me a judge, an arbiter between you? Then Jesus, like he usually does, uses this conflict between the two two brothers to teach a life lesson. And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. You know, there is an internet site where some psychologist was trying to say that squabbles over inheritances aren't really about greed, they're about feelings. Well, he was a psychologist, and for folks like him, everything's about feelings. And there's nothing wrong with that. It is his profession, and we really need psychologists. But let me be very clear here this morning. In most quarrels over a family estate, it's all about greed. I have it in my family, and you probably have it in yours. And it has really, really surprised me. It's all about, I want my fair share of the inheritance, and I want it first. And the more property and the more money there is, the nastier it becomes. And it is pretty sad. Greed is a terrible thing, is it not? Jesus said that greed is one of the attitudes that can make us unclean. Look at the scripture from from. From Mark 7, 21 to 23, it says, For from within, out of men's heart, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. Look at Romans, uh, the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 29. It it, it declares that godliness, godless, that the godless and wicked men have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. Greed is compared to being wicked and evil, folks. And Ephesians, the book of Ephesians says that but fornication and impurity of any kind or greed must not even be mentioned among you as is proper among the saints. In Scripture, then, greed is equal to wickedness, godlessness, adultery, slander, murder, and the list goes on and on. If you would make a biblical top ten list of sins in the Bible, greed would be there. In fact, in Colossians 3.5, it equates greed with idolatry. So why would Jesus then call these men's inheritance a problem? Well, let's look at some of these things. They both wanted something they did not deserve. For who really deserves an inheritance? It is money or property and stuff uh, someone else worked for. We certainly do not deserve the finances our parents leave us, for they do so much uh, for us to begin with. Another thing that would call attention to this inheritance being a problem is 
it might seem that these brothers were willing to sacrifice their relationships for the sake of money or property. Now, I cannot be the only person in this room that has seen this lived out. It is a real problem sometimes. It can divide families. Lastly, these men were willing to put their faith in riches and not in God. Jesus diagnosed the problem, and then he does what he usually does with a problem. He told a parable. We call it the rich fool. The parable was about a successful businessman. He was a farmer, and his fields were so productive that he had much more than usual. He had barns to store his crops in, but they weren't big enough. So he decided to tear them down and build larger ones. Well, and that makes sense, right? In fact, he says in verse 19, And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, think, and be merry. Now, what is wrong with that? I mean, how many of us would like to be rich enough to retire and enjoy life? I have to admit that I have thought about that. I'm sure you have too. Lisa Birchfield, our, our office manager here, asked one of her kids what they wanted to be when they grew up, and he said, I'd like to be retired. You know, money isn't everything. But as the late Spike Milligan said, all I ask is the chance to prove that money can't make me happy. Jesus condemned the wealthy man. Not because he was wealthy. As I said before, many of the godly people in the Bible were wealthy. And we may know some godly people who are wealthy. But because he wasn't, he wasn't because it was wealthy, it was because he wasn't wealthy towards God. It became a distraction from God. And this is what Jesus said. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. What does it mean to be not rich toward God? It means you cut God out of the picture. Someone can be rich enough to purchase a home by just writing a check, enough money to pay all their bills and buy anything they want. But they cut God out of the picture. They think they have everything they need and they don't need God. I have seen this. I, I worked doing youth ministry um, up in the uh, suburbs of Erie. It's a place called Fairview, and it's a pretty wealthy area. And I would drop some of the kids off at their, at their homes after youth group that almost looked like this church from the outside. Their homes were that big. It was the hardest place ever to do ministry because they did not think that they needed anything else. They had everything. They did not think that they needed Christ or God. You know, God, again, does not condemn wealth. God did not condemn David or Abraham or Solomon, people in the Bible who were wealthy because they were rich to God. Jesus did not condemn people for being wealthy. He condemned them for being greedy. Someone asked a wealthy man once, what it would take to make him happy, and he replied, just one more dollar. Greed is the belief that if I only have enough, I will be happy. Greed is not just about money either. We see that with our kids and toys. If you get two kids together, they fight over the toys, or sometimes it is the t attention, or who has the most. Now, has anybody in this room today played the game called life? 
you probably have some, some time or another. It's, it's that game with that cool spinner thing in the middle of the board. Well, a gentleman named Greg Nettle told about the Christmas his seven-year-old daughter, Tabitha, received the SpongeBob SquarePants version of the game of life. And as they played uh, the game, Tabitha thought the person who reached the finish line first would be the person who won the game. But then Greg read the instructions, and the rules literally say, they say this, at the end of the game, the winner is the person with the greatest net worth. Not the person who crosses the finish line, not the person who helped the most people, not the person who gave the most away. The winner is the person who accumulates the most wealth. Or another way to say it is, the person with the most toys wins. Folks, we teach greed. We teach greed to our children. So let's review some of the points that we learned today from this scripture. Greed makes us unclean. Greed makes us block God out of our lives. And we didn't really say this, but we did in a way. Greed can be caused by worry. And now, not all people who worry are greedy, but if we allow our worry to control our lives, we will try to get what we want by any means. So Jesus identifies a problem here this morning that we all can identify with. And then he provides a solution. And the solution is faith. The cure to greed is to realize that God will provide and supply our needs. So where are you this morning? Maybe you are longing for a better life. The answer is not about stuff or money or property. Are you at a place where you are okay with what you have and are are ready to give it all away? But you know what? It doesn't do us any good to give it away if you haven't come to Jesus first. You know, we, we will probably be, never be Mark Zuckerberg, but we can be people of faith, not letting greed control us. And if you did your research or do your research, you will find out that we Americans, sometimes even in our poverty, are by far some of the most privileged people in the world. Are we rich toward God? You know what makes me laugh? This. We spend most of our life saving up and spending on stuff, acquiring more and more. And then the last part of our life, we realize that we don't need or want a lot of times any of this stuff. And we try to start giving it away. But you know what? Everyone else is acquiring their stuff and they don't want our stuff. So we end up with a ton of stuff that we really don't want or need at the end of our life. So the question that I want to leave this morning is that at the end, will we be people that have a lot of stuff that we worked for for our whole life? Or will we be people of faith? Uh, Will we be people of faith willing to transform the world for the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Lord God, as we think about this thing called greed, we see it in our corporate world. We see it in our families a lot of times. We see it in our neighborhoods. And Lord, sometimes we even see it in our churches. But Lord, convict us in the areas that we need to be convicted to. And let us be people of faith, knowing that you alone will supply what we need. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Let's respond to the word this morning with the hymn of praise, My Faith Looks Up to Me, to Thee, uh, number 452.
You may be seated. As we go to the Lord in prayer today, let me draw your attention to the opposite side of your scripture this morning. These are the people that we are praying for. Are there any folks that we need to be adding on to for celebration or for prayer this morning? Well, we want to celebrate the fact that we had a wedding here yesterday. Um, Rob Tantlinger and Shelley Woodall um, were married here in our sanctuary, and we had a great celebration with them. Any other things? Barb. Oh, your brother and his wife had his, their 50th wedding anniversary. Barton in Jan, did you say? Okay. Barnes. Okay, that's a great celebration. And we had, um, we had a great meeting this week with all the first responders. Um, Jeremy and I and uh, David and Sam from Christ Church um, took the first responders out to lunch and, and met with them and talked about our 9-11 service. As we, we gear up for that. Um, uh, if you can believe that, it's just a little more than a month away, um, and we can be excited about worshiping in the park and celebrating with that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Let's prepare our hearts. Pray with me. Lord, we come to you this morning recognizing who you are in our life. You are Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. You are Creator God, and, and we praise you because of that. At times, Lord, we are not worthy to come and stand before you, but we thank you so much for your grace and for the loving act of giving us your Son and giving us salvation. And as we, we thank you for that, we realize at times we are not people who deserve that, that we walk away from you, that we get caught up in things like busyness and, and greed and other things, Lord. And we ask that you would continue to bring us back to you. We thank you for the celebrations that we are celebrating for 50th wedding anniversaries, for weddings, for events yet to come. And Lord, we, we, we lift those things up to you. We want to pray for those in our church that are sick and, and are, are homebound and not able to get out. We continue to pray for folks like Barb Weagle and for Chuck McMurdy, for Rose Shalott, for Ron Masters, for Betty Brooks. We pray for those folks and we lift them up to you. We thank you in the midst of that for our own health and for our own uh, celebrations, Lord. And we lift up those that we don't even know in our community that are struggling with them, those things. And we pray that we would be the church that they need to, to experience, that we could reach out to our community community, that we would be people who work for the kingdom of God. And Lord, as we pray that this morning, we think about the way that you have taught us how to pray, and we pray that prayer saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts this morning for the morning offering. Jesus is calling, 
calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling a sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling, O sinner, come home. Lord God, we thank you for such a place that we can go when we are weary and we are tired. We thank you for our church. And as we receive this gift this morning of offering, we pray that we would be able to use it to reach out to our community and show we have such a place and that we have the answer for a lot of our problems. And that answer is you. And we just pray, Lord God, that you would bless this offering and bless us in the process. And we pray this in your name. Amen.
So let's go forth in peace, knowing the grace of Christ, the love of the Father, and the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How are you? You doing okay? Okay. Good for you. That's the way we got to be, huh?